Hello, everyone. Welcome to this installment of SOCAP Next. These are conversations that are designed to take us all to our next levels of action. Thank you so much for tuning in from wherever you are uh, around the world. I know we have an exciting conversation set up for you and really looking forward to digging into uh, this conversation led by Justin. So Justin, I'm gonna turn it over to you. And um, I also just want to say an extra thank you to Bailey Gifford for helping to sponsor this entire set of SOCAP Next Conversations. Um, and then uh, we will be hearing more from, from them and our panelists right now. So Justin, over to you. Thank you, Carrie. And thank you for to the whole team at SOCAP. Uh, you guys have been such a, a wonderful um, leader in the industry um, for these types of discussions and the various events that you put on since uh, Impact Investing um, early days. So wonderful to be a part of this. And I thank um, and welcome everyone that's tuning in for this, this um, great discussion. I am dialing in from Minnesota, um, the headwaters of the Mississippi, and uh, more importantly, the ancestral lands of the Dakota Native American tribe. And while I'm here, um, I work for a company called Pacific Community Ventures based in the Bay Area in California that is a nonprofit community development financial institution or CDFI. It's been around for about 20 some years and we've, we've uh, focused on investing in minority and women owned businesses in throughout California, providing uh, technical support through a business advising platform that is at, uh, both in the state of California for our own investing, but you can gain access to that throughout the, uh, the entire uh, US. And then the, the research and consulting practice that I had head up focused on impact measurement and management, um, supporting institutional clients, building out impact investing strategy um, and fund managers that are developing new product uh, in the industry. So that's a little bit about PCV. Um, I'm, uh, today we have with us an incredible um, panel. Um, what I think is in, interesting is, is the diversity and perspective that my fellow panelists will be able to offer. We have um, an in, independent institutional investment consultant um, with Veris Investments, one of the largest uh, in the industry that's been around for over 30 years. We've, we have one of the largest public pension funds uh, in the US. Um, and we have one of the largest and oldest fund managers in, in the world um, with uh, Bailey Gifford. So why don't I pass it to Eileen to, to provide some additional perspective on um, your background and, and the organization you work with. Sure, thank you, Justin. And hello, everyone. And I'm uh, dialing in from uh, beautiful Maui, Hawaii, uh, where I'm on vacation with my family. But uh, my background is that I have been an institutional investment consultant for over 30 years. And I've been at Barris uh, just shy of, of just about three and a half years. Um, my uh, focus is on large um, uh, public funds, typically, and I um, provide a variety of um, uh, services such as asset allocation, um, policy development, um, investment research, um, manager uh, evaluation and monitoring. Um, and an area that I've been focusing on since I've joined Veris has been uh, ESG and impact investing, uh, helping our firm to sort of um, uh, sharpen, if you will, our uh, uh, knowledge and skills uh, of the impact and ESG uh, environment. So I'm uh, happy to be participating on this panel and looking forward to the discussion. Thanks, Aileen. Nick? Good morning, everyone. And thank you, Justin, for the opening remarks. And thank you, SoCap and Bailey Gifford, for um, letting us participate in this panel. We're excited to be here and delighted to join you all in a fascinating discussion and area of focus. Um, I'm Nick Abel. I work for CalSTRS. Um, for those of you that don't know us, we manage the pension assets for the California State Educators. Um, our assets under management are about $290 billion, give or take today. 
And my role at CalSTRS is I'm on the Sustainable Investment and Stewardship Strategies Unit. Um, we're not an asset class, but we're a distinct um, unit within the investment department um, where we have our own pool of capital that we invest. We manage, I help co-manage about $10 billion of listed equity strategies predominantly focused on the intersection of long-term sustainability value drivers um, and trying to identify investment opportunities that are added to, to the total fund. Um, and prior to joining CalSTRS, I was at West Path Investment Management where I led strategy and execution for their ESG integration efforts. And before that was at RB Coons and Associates, an institutional investment consultant, and prior to that, a growth equity fundamental analyst at Saturna Capital. Very happy to be here today with you all and participate in the, in the broader discussion. Thanks, Nick. And Ed, you wanna round us out? Sure, and thank you, Justin. Thank you, Soka, and my other fellow panelists. Um, so as Justin said, I work at Bailey Gifford, which is a UK-based investment manager uh, with roughly just over 400 billion assets under management. Uh, and we mainly invest in global listed equities um, with a long-term time horizon. Um, I'm a senior impact analyst, and I'm sure we'll come on to what that is in a minute, um, at on Bailey Gifford's positive change strategy. Uh, which is now four years old, uh, and it's a concentrated portfolio of global listed equities uh, with the dual objectives. Um, we're looking for obviously attractive financial returns, and our, our second objective um, is that the company's products and services contribute to a more sustainable and inclusive world. I've been at Bailey Gifford for, for just over three years, and um, before working at Bailey Gifford, I, I was a consultant on risk and social impact mostly in private equity and insurance. Um, and while I have some exper experience of impact investing in, in private equity, most of my impact investing experience comes in, in the public markets. Thanks, Ed. So we have the uh, institutional investment consultant or a gatekeeper to a wide variety of, of institutional investors with Veris and Eileen. And we have an asset owner with Nick and Calsters um, overseeing one of the largest pensions. And, and then Ed with, uh, with Bailey Gifford on, on managing um, a, a fund uh, that's dedicated to both competitive financial return and, and impact. So I, I really am excited about rounding out this discussion from all of your perspectives. I would like to clarify too though, the panel's title is, is talking about balancing scale returns and measurability and impact investing. And I think uh, balancing implies there's necessarily a trade-off um, between these, these three areas. And the scale and market returns are, um, are actually positively correlated and measuring impact is essential to uh, the industry's continued growth. So I think it's, uh, we actually, we erred in, in entitling it such, we should have called it optimizing scale returns and measure, measurable impact. So I think that's the first point of clarification. And then to set the framework, just to make sure it's clear for all of our listeners, um, our discussion today will we'll definitely focus on market rate return, competitive financial return um, side of the impact investing um, industry versus any type of concessionary or catalytic um, capital. Um, so just a, uh, I wanted to highlight that. and. Wanted to then open it up with kind of a, a more of a general question uh, for our panelists. Um, what role um, of impact investing in different, uh, do you believe in it, investing in different asset classes and how can this be achieved at different scales? So Ed, do you wanna kind of lead us out on, on this one? Yeah, sure. So as I said, public equities is our, is our domain at the moment. Um, and fundamentally, uh, impact investing there is about is about scale. Um, I think public equity impact investing really brings the scale that's required to address some of the world's greatest challenges. And I think the the figure for funding the SDGs annually is something like five to seven trillion. Well, public markets can can bring billions to that total. Um, I think that. You know, I suppose, how does the capital work for impact in public markets? And as well as the provision of primary capital, um, which we often do through IPOs um, or raises, I think enabling a lower cost of capital for companies achieving impact is really important. Secondly, I think um, 
as a company goes private in an effort to scale and to grow uh, and to reach new heights of growth, I guess, um, this is not the time for a company to lose that voice of a shareholder, which is supportive and aligned with its, its mission um, of achieving impact. So we believe that impact investors in public markets, markets can provide that crucial voice and, and stewardship that companies need. And then thirdly, I would say that, and uh, linked to my first point, to, to try to provide, we want to try to provide access to impact investing to a greater number of investors, um, so retail investors too. Uh, and we feel that through allowing people to invest their savings and pensions in companies which, um, who, whose products and services are aligned with their own values is, is a virtuous cycle. Uh, and we think it's really important. That doesn't say there's not challenges in, in the public equities, as, as everybody knows. I think scale brings complexity um, and certainty too. And, and that's why the impact management and measurement piece is really important. I'm sure we'll talk about that soon. That's help, helpful perspective. And yeah, well, I think we'll, we'll definitely be getting into those types of details. Um, uh, well, Nick or, or Eileen, do you have, have any additional perspective to add there before we kind of move on? So uh, I guess I kind of think about your, the, the first question in terms of, um, you know, how a client or a plan sponsor that is looking to um, build or establish an impact program they kind of tend to look over their entire investment program. So Ed just described um, one generally very large component of any institutional portfolio, and, and for that matter, probably a retail portfolio as well, and that is public equities. But there are a number of other uh, asset classes um, in which uh, investors allocate capital and I think once you move away from public equities, then there, do be, there does become issues of um, scale in terms uh, and also opportunities. So for example, fixed income, which is another important portfolio component, um, you know, is, is limited, right? I mean, you're limited to the corporate bond segment and within that segment, um, probably limited further in terms of opportunities. And obviously there are green bonds uh, that are available for investment, but then the scale ability of those bonds uh, becomes an issue or of any uh, bond holding, um, there, there's just limited um, scale. So I think it's, um, that's a particular challenge for investors that are um, interested in um, having impact uh, exposures throughout their investment program. Um, I think where a lot of opportunities reside uh, is in the private market side, uh, particularly in private equity and to some degree in uh, private real estate to the extent that it's, you know, you're, you're developing affordable housing, for example, I think is a big play in real estate for impact investing. Um, I think there is where there is both um, potential scale and, and certainly I think even bigger opportunities because investors have an opportunity to actually work with managers and create custom portfolios that are very targeted in terms of the areas um, in which they may want to focus their impact investing. The investors typically tend to have a theme uh, that, they, that they want to have um, be pervasive throughout their portfolio, whether it is developing uh, affordable housing or if it's a focus on supporting clean energy, et cetera. Um, so I, I, I think that uh, the low hanging fruit is probably public equities, but um, in terms of the other asset classes, uh, there, there really needs to be a targeted approach developed for each of those various portfolio segments. So you're definitely seeing more of a, a purity of impact where there's, if there is an identified theme that 
you know, a client of yours is, is interested in, they, okay. uh, if a particular manager goes beyond that uh, or a particular fund strategy goes beyond that type of impact, um, they're, at, they're kind of um, sitting on the sidelines then for now, waiting for a little bit more focus. It depends. It, you know, some organizations, particularly on the endowment foundation side, tend to be very mission driven. They want to align their investing with their respective missions. And so they may have a narrower approach, whereas I think in, you know, an investor and, and Nick can probably talk to this, speak to this for Cal Sturrs, uh, a larger, maybe a public fund um, would have, um, you know, multiple themes. They simply want to have a, a number of strategies, which at the end of the day, um, they can, you know, uh, measure as having achieved some sort of impact objective. Hmm. All right. Thanks, Eileen. Well, Nick, if you don't, yeah, if you don't mind, Justin, I might jump in on that. I think Eileen's spot on. I think, you know, from, from our perspective too, and apologies, I didn't frame this in the intro remarks, Currently, our sustainable investments team manages a, a listed equity portfolio, and, and that's a portfolio I help co-manage. We're um, this month going to the board with um, a request to expand our delegated authority to move into other asset classes. And not dissimilar to Ed, our focus there is we have a dual objective. And so our portfolio's primary objective is to secure the financial um, retirement and security for our pension participants and sustain the trust of the California educators. And so in that context, it's returns focus and wants to be added to the total fund. But the second objective is we want to be able to deploy capital um, in meaningful opportunities that have demonstrable positive contributions to a more sustainable global economy, um, largely because we think it helps create a more resilient financial market over the long term, which helps us secure um, the retirement readiness of our pension participants. And so to that point on scale, what I think is interesting on our, what we bring to the table in this discussion is what we're trying to do is learn by doing in our own portfolio. And so in our, in, in, in the small pool of assets that we get to co-manage for CalSTRS, we try and showcase that you can have, or you can seek out investments that have demonstrable contributions to a more sustainable global economy while being additive to the total fund. And so learning by doing, and sometimes these investments across different asset classes are nascent. Um, but as they grow and scale, you know, phase two then is being able to work with our other colleagues in different asset classes to try and bring along with us um, the opportunity set as these kind of emerging investment opportunities might bloom into something that might become more institutionally investable. And so I think that scale piece is interesting because we certainly see that as a phasing approach of trying to tackle kind of smaller investment opportunities today with our team showcasing the proof of concept with the hopes that it'll one day be able to grow into a larger um, pool of investment opportunities for our other colleagues. Well, thanks, Nick. Um, you, I imagine there, with such a large portfolio and so many different um, asset classes that you have exposure to currently, um, and the governance involved in something like that, you, can you elaborate a little bit more on the the interaction between the, the governance uh, and how that direction will inf um, determines what you're, how you're investing and what you're able to, to, um, to do, um, especially on your team. And I, I guess I'd, I'd bring in the fact that I know we've talked in the preparation a little bit about you know the, the mixed signals that we've seen from the government um, on some guidance on, on how to take into consideration ESG or if ESG. Um, risk uh, can be considered in decision making? Yeah, I think from just maybe at a very high level, you know, from a governance model perspective, our portfolio um, effectively has kind of two components. And for folks interested, you can see some of this information in our public documents. But, you know, one element of that is kind of what we're effectively calling our scaling portfolio, where we will collaborate with our investment colleagues um, to scale investment opportunities that are added to the total fund. So leveraging our real estate investment colleagues' expertise or private equity colleagues' expertise, et cetera. Um, the other uh, pool of capital, though, will be kind of what we deem this new opportunities portfolio, where our team is kind of demonstrating the proof of concept for something that maybe we believe we have a differentiated view on um, that we think could be added to the total fund. But for whatever reason, whether it's a benchmark consideration or size consideration or something, some of our other colleagues might not be able to take action on that. And so. 
two different governance models for how that portfolio is managed. And to your point on the DOL, you know, I think philosophically we're very aligned with how Bailey thinks about kind of investing in the space in the sense that it's not concessionary returns or looking for, you know, commensurate risk adjusted returns that are market rate. And so when we, when we, when you play that nexus of the aspiration of trying to have positive contributions towards a more sustainable global economy and fulfilling your fiduciary duty and finding attractive risk adjusted returns that the overlap of those two concentric circles um, we really don't think there's a whole lot of issue with regards to kind of DOL rulings or different um, comments that are issued by, by various folks, um, largely because we're squarely focused on being additive to the total fund is kind of the, the first objective. And the second objective is being able to demonstrate positive contributions. And so it's not a this or that, but a this and that. And so that kind of keeps you clear from kind of the discussion on what you can or can't do, because at the end of the day, we're principally focused on securing the retirement readiness of pension participants. Interesting. Um, but it's always um, helpful to hear how you're processing information and kind of guidance from the broader market and specifically like the, the, the government uh, regulation. Um, Ed or Eileen, uh, any additional perspective, I guess, on um, maybe some um, barriers that we're, um, that we're seeing? I know, Eileen, you already commented on, on some of the scale aspects of it, um, but um, maybe Ed, from your vantage point, being in the most liquid asset class, um, focused on, on um, a concentrated portfolio, any additional comments on what you're seeing as the biggest barriers? I'll just pick up on one of Nick's points there about um, the not compromising on either of those objectives. I think that's something we found very useful having the dual objective. And I think we all, our mantra is kind of purpose, it, purpose complements profit. Uh, and it's something we, uh, you know, we have seen uh, through our investments, you know, you very often see if your impact metrics are rising, um, the share price is usually going up too, and the earnings are, are doing well as well. And uh, to, to pick up on one other point that Nick made is that, yeah, we, I think, again, we're quite aligned and we do believe that over the long term, you know, the health of society is, is really important for the health of, of markets and economies going forward and therefore investments in the future. And, and that's another reason why looking after to stakeholders is so crucially important um, from an ESG perspective. Um, in terms of barriers, I think the sort of the obvious one um, and the hurdle that we come up against a lot of the time is that data and disclosure that you get from public listed companies. Um, I'm quite confident and, and positive about the level and, and amount of data that we're going to get in the future. You know, in some markets, it's being sort of regulated out this this data barrier. Um, in others, there's, there's lots of helpful frameworks and things that are, that are moving in, I think, the right direction generally. Um, so the level and amount I'm very positive about. The content, um, I'm hopeful, but I am wary that this drive for sort of standardization of reporting and simplification of reporting has the potential to, to stray away from em emphasizing impact and focus too much on, on some of the ESG risk metrics, which are extremely important, but don't necessarily give a, um, an accurate impression of a company's true impact on, on society or the environment. So that, that's a, a gap for us. And I think what that means for investors is, is that it can prevent you know, the reporting that we can do to our, to our clients uh, and to the asset owners. Um, uh, and that's another reason why you know, conversations with these companies from our perspective is really important because we can hopefully encourage these companies to report to report better and, and more impact focused metrics. So just to clarify that you, um, a little bit, Ed, you're, you're thinking that um, there is already or there there's a risk of more of a kind of sole focus on the ESG risk side of the equation and uh, less on the, the, the positive impact potential that could be managed? Um, yeah, I'm interested in what others think as well, whether we're just alone in, in thinking this, but yeah, that's exactly it. I think that there is 
it, it's a risk, um, but just because of the amount of resources and effort that is going into uh, into the reporting along these ESG metrics, it, it's it's missing sometimes the sort of the upside and the the positive case for some of these companies. Uh, and you know, um, it, it's a shame that a, a company who is uh, whose product or service is helping to reduce emissions that you know their reduced emissions through their products is not going to be required to be reported but their operating emissions will be required and we think there should be a bit more of a balance in the future around that because it, it's, it's a more accurate picture of, of the market that's not to say it's not extremely important to, to to have these operating emissions and it's something we of course look at in our in our process as well Am I alone in thinking this? Or? I, I think it's a really good point you bring up because, and in, in I realize that it may be different outside of the U.S., but I think within the U.S., because um, the whole um, uh, impetus behind um, ESG investing is, at least at the institutional level, is, you know, the, the phrase is to achieve a double good, right, to, to achieve positive return experience, but also to um, achieve some sort of positive, you know, impact, if you will, and um, it, it, that, that's as far as it goes in terms of the um, objective and the intent. But then we, we have, for whatever, I don't know how we've gone in this direction, but we, as you say, have been very focused on the in investment outcomes and in reporting all these metrics as they relate to um, you know, that side of the equation and then um, you know, basically ignore the um, you know the positive return, if you will, from the impact, whether it's on the environment or what have you. Now, the um, the particularly on the ENF side, but I think you know, and and Nick may do this at at CalSTRS, but investors I think are focused on both sides, if you will. I, I think that there's been a fair amount of thought and discussion in building impact and ESG policies to establishing a framework for evaluating the success or the efficacy of the strategy in achieving what its goal is from an impact side, as well as the standard, you know, metrics, which are already fairly, um, you know, tied down by MSCI and sustainability and other vendors on the investment and portfolio side. So I think um, you know, it, it, it has to, it has, those particular metrics, I think, have to somehow become part of that um, package when you're talking about results from your um, respective ESG or impact strategy. Yeah, I think, too, I, I, I agree with Irene and Ed, you know, I think, too, the other thought that kind of sometimes comes to mind is um, when we're thinking about ESG metrics and kind of the trying to be overly precise with established frameworks. You know, frameworks are good and metrics are good, but this notion of dynamic materiality and, you know, under the thesis that the future will look different than the past and purpose-driven corporations or businesses or assets over long multi-decade time horizons, inevitably things will change. And so to the extent that you overemphasize backward looking metrics, I think sometimes you run the risk of being you know, precisely wrong instead of approximately right in terms of the trajectory of where business might be going. And so I think I would echo that. I think that's a tension too, um, just in terms of, and I think Justin, you have some interesting insights on this. And so I'd love to pull you into this, but the, the tension of balancing being rigorous and having integrity with the program, but also being practical and fluid enough as the space evolves, as the world changes, as the future continues to look different. You know, how do you balance both of those from an investor perspective? I think your vantage point advising investors, you probably have some unique insights there, but I, I would echo what Ed and Eileen are saying on that as well. Well, I appreciate that, uh, Nick. And it, we do see, uh, I would, it's a great point. I mean, the, the fact that it is a balance between the rigor and, and the efficiency of, of that information that you're collecting, it can't be only useful for the investor 
in reporting out uh, the impact. It, we see, especially uh, PCV and our small bi uh, business lending activity, um, these are businesses that are, are literally you know, just trying to survive, especially in the global pandemic that we've been experiencing for the last year, um, just trying to survive um, for another day financially. And so to, to collect information, have them focus on gathering and reporting information that isn't actually helpful for their their day-to-day -day management and the the future success um, is is um, yeah you're just you're just working against both the, the the potential impact that could be created and and the the financial return of course but um, so we're very pragmatic about these systems that we're building for for that we're working with our clients on on in the impact measurement and management it needs to be information that's both helpful for the investor um, and the, the investee, the underlying company, or the fund manager in, in, run, in executing a strategy like Ed, Ed Bailey Gifford does. Um, this is something that you want, and I'm sure that the companies that you're, you're, you're investing in, becoming partners with, in a way, that information needs to serve um, everybody. Um, and it, because it takes time, it takes uh, a, a, to collect and to manage and it's, there's a cost to that. Um, so it's not, um, we just, we're very particular about that. As much as it would be nice to report on a, a wide variety of impact, um, we hone in on, try to be m m very focused on what would be the most insightful um, impact measurement, um, what types of KPIs would be the most uh, in, insightful. Because um, a lot of times there's gonna be high correlation between various um, metrics. And, and so if you have one, there's a good chance you're going to have an increase in another, and so the collecting both really doesn't doesn't um, isn't additive, um, and actually can work against. So, great um, perspectives from from all of you in, in that regard. Um, I think that the audience is where very well versed on the standards and indoor resources that have, in, especially in the last few years, the frameworks that are really evolving. Um, and be becoming widely ad uh, adopted across the industry and um, great resources like IRIS Plus, um, the IFC's operating principles of impact management. And so I don't mean to get into the weeds on, on kind of parsing these, but any comments from anyone on, on uh, specific resources that you're either have um, always found useful or more recently are, are kind of looking into and, and, and leveraging and, and see great potential. Um, just some quick responses there, I guess. I'll jump, I'll jump in. I think from, from an internal perspective, things that we have um, been aided in the past and helped uh, develop is the, the theory of change framework, just a very simple, uh, inputs, activities, outputs, comes impact. It's just a really helpful way to think about how a company's intervention or product is, is achieving impact. Just really simple, but it's, it's proved to be extremely helpful because you can evidence it a, a, along the, the chain. And that's something that we produce annually in our impact report. And it's a helpful prompt for us internally to, to see where the impact's going, but also we then have that audited. So we're, there's some verification around, around our process. And the second thing which we've using more recently uh, is the impact, idea of an impact hypothesis. Um, so quite often in our, in our process that will, that will come before we do our impact analysis from an investment manager or someone who's bringing the idea to us. And that will be saying, over the next five to 10 years, we believe that this company will have this impact. And then it's up to, to us, the impact analysts, to, to test that theory, I suppose, uh, and to really think about. And what that does is it encourages us to be forward looking and not rely on just the, the metrics that are reported by the company today. Um, because in, in things like healthcare, and I think Moderna is a good example of this in our portfolio is that you know, a few years ago, it hadn't treated when, when we invested, it hadn't, hadn't provided anything for any patient, really, a very small population size. Um, but it's about that hypothesis around the platform that it was building um, to enable them to do that in the future. So, yeah, th there we have to be quite patient with companies at times, it's particularly in the healthcare space where you have pipelines of the future. Um, but Moderna is a really good example for us of where that hypothesis really came into its own and, and hopefully will continue to play out over 
the next few years. Um, I'll just say externally on, I think the impact management project projects five dimensions is a useful framework as well for, for reporting. And I agree with you on the IFC's operating principles, um, neither of which we use actually, because we, we developed our own process um, prior to that. But, you know, I, I think both of them have a lot of merit. And I presume they, they were uh, something that may have informed your, your thinking. So you kind of use the, those resources and then customize to your specific strategy. Well, I think actually our, our strategy predated uh, those being published. So we felt that, but what we will always do is look at our process and, and see whether it fits in with, with um, some of the external standards. And um, maybe we can talk about it in a minute, but our process, we think it does cover all those five dimensions of, of impact from the IMP. You know, it, it's one thing, I mean, just coming up with impact hypotheses, um, for individual companies and theories of change um, takes a lot of time and effort and uh, especially the dialogue you have you know being a, a long-term investor you're you're not looking at hundreds and hundreds of, of companies to establishing that that type of deep relationship with it's it's fairly concentrated um, so it, it takes a lot of resources though um, and you're dealing with large liquid companies I guess for Nick or Eileen and, and bringing in different asset classes or different strategies. Um, any comments about um, or insights with re um, regard to the, the, the resources that are required for this, um, that uh, just the time and energy that you're putting into this. I'm, I'm also seeing some in the chain of questions that are coming in where from audience members talking about um, startups and, and private equity managers and how it's different um, for them, you know, especially with a lot more limited resources. I'm happy to jump in and I, I mean, unless you'd like to go first. All right, um, you know, I think, I think from our perspective on, on resourcing, we'd completely agree. I mean, in fact, for folks interested, we're actively hiring, we have more positions open. Um, <laughs> I always take a public opportunity to share, but, I think you're spot on. I think what we found is it is resource intensive. And so trying to figure out how to staff up appropriately, um, how to leverage, uh, you know, leverage frameworks. I wanted to pick back up on what Ed said, you know, from, from our vantage point, we certainly don't think that we have a perfect, you know, process by any means. And we're actively in discussions with folks. Um, you know, we've appreciated what IMP does, um, we're particularly excited about the statement of intent for various um, frameworks and platforms to start working together to align and consolidate um, metrics and frameworks where possible. It's exciting for us, but um, we're certainly learning by doing. And, and we found that there's this natural square circle where you can't always just um, bolt on other frameworks or processes, though we do like consensus being developed in the industry. And so having to try and build something more tailored or bespoke to the investment process and the different types of assets that we're trying to manage. And so similar to what Ed was saying, it's definitely a balancing act of trying to align with what's emerging as gold standards, but also trying to, you know, be nimble and creative to develop things where, where appropriate. I think maybe one shout out that I'd also give is we found um, SASB, while it's not an impact framework, um, their underlying KPIs that they look at, um, we think are particularly interesting, not least when you look at the mappings that have been done by Bob Eccles and others looking at underlying SDG targets and SASB indicators. And I think what's helpful for us there is, you know, we too, when we start the process, you know, for sourcing deals, we'd like to try and link an investment hypothesis and a kind of a hypothesis around how long-term sustainability shifts or trends are creating structural changes across industries or geographies that we think could be accretive over much longer time horizons. And so maybe nascent today could be larger in the future. And so we try and identify or leverage various folks work to try and see what some of those theses could be and then what are appropriate KPIs to kind of test that thesis as we conduct due diligence to see if there is alignment with the investment strategy and kind of the notion of wanting to have um, real positive contributions to society, people and planet at large. But the resource piece, I think you're spot on. It's, it's quite challenging, um, quite time intensive. Interesting. Um, are you finding that there are more opportunities 
the, to to investigate, then you have time to investigate uh, in the depth and um, and kind of scrutiny that you 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 need. Uh, or is there a limitation on the supply of, of, of good product out there to, to research? I'd be curious to hear, um, Ed or Eileen, from your vantage points. From ours, we, we certainly are busy. <laughs> we think there's a lot of interesting ideas. Um, and sometimes the challenge is how to, how to prioritize those ideas and how to size them appropriately, especially if you're looking across the capital structure, or across industries, geographies, or asset classes. You know, how do you think about concentration, risk, kind of financial analysis and all the typical work that you do, but then also the dimension of real world implications for what you're backing, owning, or wanting to support with your capital. And that makes us quite busy, but I'd be curious if we're alone in that or if others echo that as well. Uh, I would say it is a huge challenge. It's almost like a, you know, drinking from a fire hose in terms of there's so many strategies. Again, as an institutional consultant, we're covering all asset classes in, in which um, plan sponsors um, wish to allocate capital. And, and there's uh, such a breadth of um, product uh, with varying um, objectives, you know, sustainability being some governance being others, um, you know, I think about activists investing that's focused on governance. And, um, and, and then, you know, we have uh, a, an issue with some of our clients, some of our most active clients in the, this space that want to have, um, you know, exposures that either targeted or, or even more broad, um, they may not have the um, capital um, to go into, particularly in the private market side, they may not have capital to um, disperse uh, across a diverse set of strategies. And so the risk is um, you know, being dependent on one or two strategies and, and, and then there's manager specific risk on top of all the other um, types of, of risks that we try to evaluate in, in identifying appropriate strategies for our clients. So, um, you know, our, our challenges, we have clients that range from, you know, a few hundred million in size to multiple billions and trying to um, come up with um, attractive alternatives in this space that is suitable across that range of clients so it, it's a it's a huge challenge um, again that low-hanging fruit being I think the public equity side uh, because you know everyone has to have all, all institutional portfolios have to have some public equity exposure and um, you know that seems to be the place again because of the scale um, where we have more um, more opportunities that can be spread across that very uh, broad client base than we do once we start migrating, particularly into private markets. And I think in private equities, you know, the question earlier about resources, I, I, I think that they're really challenged in terms of having resources which enable them to be able to, um, you know, effectively measure and monitor how their particular investments are um, meeting the objectives or meeting their stated goals with respect to whatever um, their their theme is uh, that that uh, that the capital is being allocated towards. So um, there's a lot of, uh, I think, opportunity for vendors uh, that are focused on developing these frameworks and metrics uh, on that private market side in particular. For a more standardization or common commonality? Yes, yes, for more standardization, exactly. Are you finding, I mean, with the, the variety of clients you're dealing with, is, is uh, are you finding that their different interests, different impact interests are really limiting their ability, your ability to um, find appropriate investment? Um, 
In, in some cases, I, I think that's probably true. Um, but I think the, um, you know, for us, we have to ensure that we're providing, you know, the best advice and the best solutions for our clients. And, um, you know, so we can't, we can't treat one differently than the other. And, and, and so what I think the difficulty is for us is there's so, there's funneling these opportunities that we see in the impact and in ESG space, um, trying to uh, slot those into these various categories. Like, okay, that, that would be a great strategy for our ENF clients that are focused on climate, for example. Um, or, you know, this would be an applicable strategy for our very large clients because it's potentially broader in nature and that's more appealing to them and is more scalable. And so, um, you know, we have to try to find the best in class, if you will, uh, that would be appropriate for, um, you know, say a small, very focused client and best in class that would be appropriate for larger clients that want maybe broader um, multiple themes. Hmm. If that makes sense. It does, it's helpful. And I know Nick, we're gonna be losing you actually. You have a, a client meeting you have to jump to in just a few minutes. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll just come back to you before I um, uh, circle back with Eileen and, and Ed. Um, and we have some questions coming in, general questions talking about alignment um, of interests in both impact and financial return and how you ensure that, uh, or what are ways in which you, you, um, you uh, better understand the commitment to the impact side of the equation. But any parting words from you or um, additional insights you care to share? Well, I appreciate you flagging that. And a, a thousand apologies everyone for having to drop early, but um... I think from our perspective, we're, we're just delighted to join uh, Bailey, SOCAP, and, and the fellow panelists to frankly learn from you all and participate in the growing conversation in this space. We think it's exciting. I think I did see one question from the audience about advice to startups. Um, and I think picking up on what you were saying, Justin, about alignment, you know, from our, our vantage point, I think to the extent that you're able to focus on KPIs that are material to the enterprise value creation or the sustainable value creation of the business and kind of the, the two pieces trying to figure out where do the concentric circles lie for your organizations I think is great because what we found is sometimes folks can get caught up with um, over disclosing perhaps things that might not be material to a business and so trying to balance internal resources as you're new and emerging I think Justin you talked about this about smaller businesses and folks getting started you know I think trying to be intentional about the KPIs that are unique for your asset or your business or your value proposition that also tie into the, the purpose of the organization and the, the positive contributions the organization believes it can have or desires to have on society, you know, people or planet. I think focusing on that and so maybe having a little bit of like an internal discussion before going out to other frameworks and just grabbing what's available, I think is what we've seen to be useful for folks, but I'm sure uh, the other experts on this panel have have other remarks than that. Thanks, but Nick. Very much, and I th I'm very sorry that I'll have to drop in about four or five minutes. But thank you for flagging that, Justin. Ed or, or Eileen, any anything to add on to that? Not really. I, I would just say um, a point you made earlier about being busy, Nick. <laughs> We're really busy too. <laughs> like it is, um, it is a really busy space at the moment, and I think you have lots of companies trying to demonstrate their impact potential as well. Um, and you know, from our perspective, the reason why we resource up is so that we can work out whether that's 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 true or not. Um, and so, with the, the amount of IPOs at the moment, it, it's really busy. For us there's lots of opportunity which is amazing and hugely exciting um but also quite you know hard work and we also like to get to know companies before they book they ipo so there is an iceberg of companies wanting to deliver impact 
uh, under the water that you just can't see that we're, you know, we're trying to, to meet with and understand more about. And I think that um, it's going to make us very busy for the next few years. So, you know, anything that we can do and counselors can do and, and, and consultants can do to sort of spread, uh, you know, help expand the impact investing market is going to be really important um, over the next few years. Um, so that was just on a previous point. I just wanted to have that. Helpful. Um, I know we're getting some questions specifically about healthcare in low to middle income countries, but I, um, I know you can't be specific about um, too much about what's in the portfolio, Ed, um, or comments about um, that uh, kind of new opportunity that you might be considering uh, might trip some regulatory wires for mm -hmm. you. But uh, um, so I'll let you add perspective there if you'd like, but I'd, I'd throw it to the rest as well. Uh, just talking about impact, um, the alignment of, of impact interests and how you put teeth in that. I mean, for someone like Bailey Gifford that to, to has blank, has in the prospectus, it talks about a, a dual purpose. Um, every investment you're making, it has to generate a positive impact as well as competitive financial return. Any perspectives from the panelists in general about what more um, can be done or needs to be done to, in that regard in, in balancing those two? Or how do you ensure that both are, are not just checking the box that there's effort, but that it's truly uh, intentional and, and being managed um, to the best of their ability in, in, in both regards? Yeah. So. Um... To start, there's a lot of questions in there about so the first one on the healthcare side in low and middle income countries. You know, that's um, a hugely important question at the moment, very relevant. Um, you know, we have a healthcare theme with healthcare and quality of life theme within our in our strategy. Um, but to, to be very frank, you know, it, what it's very difficult within this space is to to identify those companies who are going to benefit low and middle income countries because of the nature of, of the healthcare industry it tends to to be concentrated in developed markets first. So uh, at, at the scale at which we are investing, perhaps. Um, that's not to say there's not opportunities, but I, I just yeah, flag that as something that is, um, is a challenge. And, and part of that is, is down to the data, the, the missing data, who are the patients being served and trying to really get to the bottom of that, which, which I guess is, a, is perhaps a bit of a, a downside to the public markets is where it's quite difficult to identify that data, but not impossible. And, and that's why we are resourced up. Um, just on the alignment side of things, I think um, one of the things we look at when we're doing our impact analysis, so we look at product impact, um, which is at, at what it says on the tin, we look at uh, business practices, which is more of a traditional ESG analysis. And then we look at um, intent of the company. And what we found is that intent of, of management uh, and the board is, is hugely important for delivering impact. And actually it is the case with, with I'll give you Safaricom is a, is a Kenyan telecoms business, which, is, which many people will know, but is in the portfolio, um, has a very strong intent, which runs deeply. And the previous management and sadly the CEO who died a couple of years ago, um, established a, a, a team within the sustainability team there, um, which has no budget and which is specifically designed to look uh, at serving their low income customers, for example. And now they're coming up with new, really interesting products. Um, one recently called DigiFarm for smallholder farmers, which is just hugely exciting. And so when we're looking in that due diligence phase, we're looking to see evidence of those types of structures and those types of um, you know strong missions to to achieve impact, uh, and so very often where we find that's strong and aligned um, is where the impact should should happen. Effectively, I, I don't. Know, I, I imagine that's that's quite a common, but I wonder if you've all seen that as well. Nick, we will give you kind of uh, right before you cut out. Uh... Any ad additional comments to that or uh, anything before you say farewell? No, I, I guess the only thing I could add to that is to the question specifically on, on low and kind of middle income countries. I think what we found too, I think that's spot on in terms of scale and identify, um, 
identify those businesses or companies or assets that you want to back. I think what we've noticed is maybe a gravitation, maybe in the private markets for some of those deals, um, just given the size and kind of where they're at. Um, uh, not to say it's not possible in listed equities, but I think that, you know, when we think about our portfolio, our hope would be to be able to pursue at least 25% of the portfolio in kind of emerging um, markets. And, and that would largely probably be in the private space to try and find and uncover those unique businesses and try and back them and help them scale. But thank you. I apologize that I have to drop now, but thank you very much for your time. And no thank word. you, SoCap, for, for welcoming us to the stage. Thank you, Nick. Nick. Uh, Eileen or, or Ed, uh, I guess we, we will have to round it out, uh, just the three of us, for the last uh, couple of minutes. Um, the, um, you know, one last question I guess I had in, in general was um, if you want to reiterate anything, um, feel free. Uh, if you have some additional comments to, to make or finish, but one last question in our final uh, time would be um, fast forwarding five, 10 years ahead. And if you have any additional perspective on what you would, um, you would hope to see in the, uh, the, this industry, uh, what, what are the expectations um, as we look out or possible guidance for where we need to go? So a uh, couple, couple of thoughts, and, and I think one touches on the discussion earlier about um, broadening the metrics for success to incorporate the ability to achieve the impact targets along with um, meeting both in investment return and risk metrics, as well as um, sort of the industry standard um, metrics for portfolio characteristics. Um, I think the issue is one of um, aligning time horizon with expectations. So it, you know, in the healthcare example for, uh, you know, public markets are measured on a very frequent basis, you know, returns are looked at often as frequently as daily, but certainly monthly and quarterly. And, um, you know, public companies in general have a shorter time horizon because of the focus on uh, bottom line profitability to shareholders. So I think this is, brings a little bit of the, you know, shareholder capitalism versus, you know, shareholder purview. Um, I think that's a real tension that uh, ultimately will become more front and center. So that, that tension um, along with that time horizon expectation, I think, uh, I think folks have to get um, more comfortable with accepting a longer time horizon for evaluating the overall success of their impact strategies, whether they be public markets or private markets. So private markets, that, you know, folks are used to adopting, a, okay, I'm not even going to look at results for at least five years. And really, it's going to be more like 10 years before I really realize my full investment potential. But in the public markets, that's a real challenge that that type of mentality doesn't exist. And I think we have to overcome that in order for, um, I think, the whole um, realm of impact and ESG strategies to really become more widely adopted by at least the US institutional plan sponsors, particularly given, you know, sort of mixed signals from the DOL and, and the regulators in terms of, um, you know, what's appropriate for metrics to be considered in that investment or portfolio creation uh, process. That's, that's uh, powerful. And uh, I couldn't, uh, it's probably a, a perfect transition, Ed, to give you 30 seconds to, to respond to uh, um, that the focus on long-termism, uh, I presume is right into, plays right into Bailey Gifford's uh, overall strategy. Yeah, th thank you, Eileen, for that. Uh, I think, um, yeah, absolutely. I think impact investing in general is a long-term game. Um, and I, 
would like to see and one of the reasons why we would like to see more people in the uh, more investors um, and asset managers take on impact investing in the public markets is because uh, system systemically we hope it should encourage long-termism which is really really important um things i'd like to see in the future i think we need to to get better looking at impact metrics and um and valuations and investment performance together uh, i think there'll be some fascinating findings um when we, we start to look do some more analysis of that of that aspect of it i think um I think it'd be really encouraging, but at the moment, I would say, you know, as I said, it's a long-term game. We need to be patient, and um, I think over time we're going to see some some great uh, things coming out of that. Any thoughts from you, Justin? I'm, I'm conscious we've been talking too long. Yeah, we're out of time. I'd love to to go into. I I agree with both of you. Long-termism for sure, and and the, the patient capital um, being a part of that is 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 so important. Um, I think. Yeah, I could go into uh, some more detail, but unfortunately, we need to wrap. Uh, it's at the top of the hour. Um, I, I appreciate both of your perspectives on this. And for the SOCAP um, guidance in all of this, making it possible, Carrie and your team, um, and the SOCAP community that's dialed in for this. Um, this is really, um, I think, a, a hopefully a meaningful discussion that uh, folks found useful. And uh, we hope to continue it in, in future conversations. And uh, again, Ed, Eileen, thank you for the perspectives. Um, and uh, thank everyone else. Um, we'll be signing off now. Thanks, Justin. Thanks, all. Thank you, thank Justin. You. And thank you, SoCat. And then Bailey Gifford. <laughs>